So we're studying the New City Catechism here at One Voice Fellowship this year because the New City Catechism is a great summary of what we believe as Christians. Um, and I'm going to read question 24 of the New City Catechism, and then on the next slide we'll read the answer together, okay? So question 24 says, why was it necessary for Christ the Redeemer to die? Let's read together. Since death is the punishment for sin, Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and bring us back to God. By his substitutionary atoning death, he alone redeems us from hell and gains for us forgiveness of sin, righteousness, and everlasting life. Great. And we have that in your bulletin in all of your other languages if you want to study that more closely. Um, so, introduction for the sermon. On the back of our church's business card, it says, we wish to see Jesus in many languages. So why is it important to see Jesus? Because only Jesus can offer us a life of shalom. Shalom is a Hebrew word that means peace, but it means more than peace. Shalom means deep contentment in all areas of life. Deep contentment in all areas of life. And that's the kind of life that Jesus offers us if we are united with him. And we can have shalom, even in this broken and painful world, if Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So this shalom continues even after we die. This shalom gives us eternal peace forever in heaven. And so to help us see Jesus more clearly so that we can have this shalom, Jesus gives us sacraments. Sacraments are visible signs and seals of Christ's finished work. Visible signs and seals of Christ's finished work. Sacraments remind us through Jesus that we're connected to God and to each other as a community of faith. And so today we're actually going to celebrate both of the sacraments. Today we're going to celebrate communion and baptism. And so for our sermon, I want to look at John chapter 6. And here Jesus talks about the source of life that lasts forever. So John 6.35, it's, it's a long passage, um, but it's good, so stick with me. John 6.35, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In verse 48, he said, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread for, from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so that the world may live, is my flesh. And then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. Now he said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And many of his disciples said, this is very hard 
to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, Does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe. And he knew which one would betray him. And then he said, This is why I said people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe, and we know you are the Holy One of God. So, together, after we hear the word of God, we read Isaiah 40, verse 8. Would you read with me? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you because you are the source of life and truth. And Jesus, we worship you because you are full of mercy and love. Holy Spirit, please open our hearts and minds to be transformed by the word of God. Amen. So Jesus says repeatedly in John 6 that he is the bread of life. And what does that mean? In verses 49 and 50, Jesus compares manna from the desert with the bread of life. And manna was a good gift, right? You know that God sustained his people in the desert for 40 years eating manna. It was supernatural bread. But the people who ate it died anyway. They drank miraculous water from the rock, but they still died. God led his people in the desert for a reason. He wanted to teach them about the source of real life. And Moses said this in Deuteronomy 8.3. says, God humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Campbell, can you go to the next slide, buddy? Thank you. That he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So Jesus is teaching this same thing in John 6. Jesus is saying to us all, I am what you need. You will find life in no one else. You will find life in nothing else. And that's why when we talk about the sacraments, we have to avoid thinking about the idea that grace comes from the sacraments or from the elements, the bread and the cup. See, in baptism, the water itself has no power. Hey, Campbell, can you go to the slide with the baptism on it? I don't know if I numbered them wrong for you, but... There we go. In baptism, the water itself has no power. This is my friend Cyril baptizing a student in D.C. He preached here in August for us. Um, the water isn't holy water. Water is a picture of Christ. It's Jesus who washes us in baptism. And that's why it isn't really important if the water is sprinkled on you or if it's poured on you or you go down in the water because more water does not give you more grace. It is Jesus himself who pours out grace through the sacraments. And eating a larger piece of bread will not deliver more Jesus to you. So don't try to get a bigger piece when you come up to this, right? <laughs> you won't get more Jesus if you take a bigger piece of bread. And a bigger cup of juice will not make you more spiritual. Because God does not put his grace in the bread and the cup, and then you eat the grace and drink the grace. No, we don't believe that the power comes to us through sacred objects. And we don't baptize people with holy water. This isn't holy bread and wine. What I'm trying to say is there's no magical power at work. 
The water of baptism points you to Jesus, who is holy. Jesus is the one who can cleanse your soul, not the water. And the bread and the wine of communion point you to Jesus, because he is the sacrificial lamb. He's the one who died to make you part of the covenant community in a permanent way. And it's the Holy Spirit who pours out spiritual blessing to strengthen and sustain you. So what I'm trying to say is the power that you need in your life is not in the bread and the cup. God is the one with the power that you need. And so look to him. So let's read again what Jesus said in verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Right? Jesus doesn't say he who eats special bread will never be hungry. Jesus says whoever comes to me, he who believes in me, they will never be hungry or thirsty. And so when we serve the bread to you, we often say this is Christ's body. And maybe that's confusing. So do we mean that the, this is Christ's actual human flesh? No, that's not what we mean. When Jesus told the disciples at the Last Supper, he said, this is my body. They knew what he was saying when he held up bread and said, this is my body. Jesus was saying, this bread represents my body, right? If, if I had a photograph and I said, this is my oldest child, Lucy. Do you think the photo is Lucy? The photo is not Lucy. It's not, the photograph isn't her. It's a picture of her. That's what the sacraments are. Jesus used all kinds of pictures to help us understand who he is and what he means to us. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the gate. Jesus said, I am the vine and the shepherd and the light of the world. Now, did Jesus ever turn himself into a door? No. Did he turn himself into a vine? No. But see, God knows that we're visual learners. We need imagery. We need metaphor and pictures to help us understand things. We're, we're just sheep. So that's why Jesus says, I'm the gate and the door. I'm the way. I'm the shepherd. Jesus is also the light and the lamb and the bread and the bridegroom and the vine. And all of these pictures help us understand the character and mission of Christ on earth. So don't put your hope in a door. Don't put your hope in a gate. Don't put your hope in the bread or the cup. Put your hope in Christ alone. And these things help you trust and understand that he is your hope alone. So why do we have sacraments? It's because these physical sacraments help us understand and receive the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. 1,600 years ago, um, a bishop in Africa named Augustine, he defined the word sacrament, and I think it's helpful. Augustine said, a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and enduring grace. And so the water of baptism is a physical picture of being washed clean by Jesus. And this table is a visible sign that reminds us Jesus is the source of true life. Now, I sympathize with the crowd in John 6. Remember how confused they were? I understand why they were confused. Look at the verses again. John 6.53 Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And many of the disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? So, why do you think Jesus used this dramatic, kind of hyperbole language if it confused people? You know, why didn't Jesus just say, hey everybody, I'm the source of life, believe in me. 
That would have been very clear. But I think Jesus uses this dramatic language of blood and flesh because he has to shake us out of our delusions of autonomy. Autonomy means I'm independent, right? Jesus is saying something to us that our stubborn hearts do not want to believe because we are all very committed to our independence. Not political independence. I'm not talking about like when maybe some of your countries fought for freedom from colonial powers. I'm not talking about that kind of independence. I'm talking about spiritual independence. Our most basic sin is our desire for autonomy and freedom from God. That's our most basic sin. And the sacraments are an antidote for the poisonous sin of pride. I'll say that again. The sacraments are an antidote for the poisonous sin of pride. Jesus says this in verse 53. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son and man and drink his blood, you can't have eternal life. This is what Jesus is saying. I am not a weekly appointment on your calendar. I am not a hobby. I am not a lifestyle that you inherited from your parents. I am not a moderately important part of your life. I'm not. I'm not a little bit important. Jesus is saying, I am your life. You depend on food and drink, right? All of us. We depend on having food and drink every day. You have to eat or drink or you will die. And Jesus is saying, you need me more than that. Jesus is saying, I am as fundamental, I am even more important to your life than food and water. And that's why he talks about blood. Let's talk about blood for a minute. Verses 55 and 56, he says, My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Now, to the Jewish mind, the life of a person or an animal was in the blood. And so to consume the blood of an animal was to drink its life, and that was forbidden. And the Jewish people also understood that blood was connected to forgiveness. When the lifeblood of an animal is poured out as a sacrifice, it paid for the penalty of sin. So today when you buy a house or a new car, you sign a contract. It's a similar activity, but we don't use blood. You sign a contract and you promise to pay back the money that you borrowed from the bank. You promise to give the house or the car back, right, if you break the contract. Now, thousands of years ago, people promised blood when they made a contract. They made a covenant and they promised blood. The blood of an animal was spilled to remind everyone how deadly serious the contract was. Now, your body has four or five quarts of blood. Your blood contains 4,000 different components in your blood. And your blood does two very important things for you. Your blood removes carbon dioxide and ammonia and other toxins. In other words, your blood prevents death by taking away toxins. And your blood also maintains life by bringing nutrients and oxygen to your cells. Isn't that interesting that your blood does both of those? See, our blood takes away toxins and brings nutrients. And the blood of Jesus takes away sin and brings life. The blood of Jesus takes away our sin and it brings life. I do understand why the disciples were confused about all this talk about blood. Right? I can sympathize with them. Look at verse 66 says, at this point, many disciples turned away and deserted him. And Jesus turned to the 12 disciples and said, are you going to leave too? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. 
Jesus lost some followers because of this teaching about flesh and blood. It was too confusing. It was too hard for some of them to accept. And so they walked away. But where did they go? I hope that many of them came back to Jesus. I hope they realized the thing that Peter understood, that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through the Son. And that's why Peter said in verse 68, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. So where else can we go, my friends? In John 6, Jesus said, true life comes by eating bread, by believing, by drinking the blood, and by hearing his words. And all of these images are communicating the same message to us, that Jesus is the only source of true life. Um, the Scottish preacher Robert Bruce said this about the sacraments. He said, in the preaching of the word, we are led to Christ by the ear, and in the sacraments, we are led to Christ by the eye. I think that's helpful. The purpose of every part of worship is to lead you to Christ. And so when we come to the table today, that's why it's not really important if it's juice or it's wine in the cup. It doesn't matter if you choose the bread or the gluten-free cracker. It doesn't matter if you sit or you kneel or you stand when you eat the bread. I grew up in the Catholic Church, and we would, we would kneel during communion. Right? We would kneel during communion. And it's okay if you stand. It's okay if you sit. This is the question, though. Is your heart kneeling? Is your heart kneeling? Even if you're standing. The sacrament is your heart's opportunity to kneel and say to the Lord, you are all I really need. That's what the sacraments do. They remind us that he is all we really need. And I want you to remember that when you see the baptism of our sister in a few minutes. And I want you to remember that when we participate in communion today. That Jesus has laid down many different paths to himself. He's given us many different ways for different people from different backgrounds to come to him. No matter who you are no matter where you have been. So if you think you can't find your way to God, Jesus says, I am the way. If God seems like he's behind a barrier and far from you, Jesus is your door. If you're feeling the weight of sin and failures, Jesus is the water who washes you. He is the blood that purifies you. When Satan reminds you of your sin and he tries to burden you with guilt, remember your baptism. Remember what it means. And when you're feeling lost, remember that Jesus is your shepherd and he will guide you. When you're feeling faint and weary, he is the vine that nourishes you. If you're feeling weak and needy, Christ is the bread that sustains you. And when you're full of joy because you're God's child, then Christ invites you to share in the cup of celebration and the wedding feast in heaven. So I'm going to close the sermon now with prayer. And then with joy and thanksgiving, we're going to celebrate both of the sacraments of baptism and communion together as a church family. Let's pray. Jesus, we are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you for being a good shepherd who knows us, who protects us, who feeds us. We are like stupid sheep. We do not learn well. And we forget the things that we learn. And so we need these different images, these metaphors and pictures to help our feeble human minds understand your love and mercy. We are stubborn. We want to go our own way. And so Holy Spirit, please remind us how much we need Jesus. And Father, remind us that we are children who depend on you for every good thing. We pray this with hope in the powerful name of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world.